coalition is preserving your life his your life story for history. Why don't we start by having you introduce yourself? Oh, I'm Frances Dunham Catless, and uh, I, I, you probably want to know my age at this point. I'm I'm going to be 94 next week. I was born in 1908. Yeah. Describe your neighborhood in Hartford, Connecticut, the house at 25 Douglas Street, and your parents. Uh, um, my mother and father had come up from Virginia, where they had evidently been on the same plantation. And this was after, and we have, um, this is just a little before we got to Hartford. Uh, we have the um, census of 1880, which shows that they were still in Virginia. And uh, he was living with his grandmother, who was 60, so therefore she was born in 1820. So this goes back a little bit. So af evidently after the proclamation, um, they, along with a lot of others, they came up to, through Springfield, Massachusetts, to Hartford, Connecticut. And at first he was in the north end of the city. The city was not uh, a liberal city, we found out later. Uh, the north end was full of tenements, and most of the people were living there. So my father, being from the plantation, bought this house in the south end of the city. And I say south end because evidently that was supposed to be sacred ground for most of the whites at that time. And so I'm one of ten children. I'm the last of ten children. So. Um, just about the time I was, my childhood, I grew up at this very wonderful place for a child to grow up in. Uh, two lots, lots of fruit trees, a short street where there were lots and meadows all around us. And interesting enough, uh, it was a um, completely in, uh, international street. So uh, my early childhood was uh, like this on that day. Are any of your sisters and brothers still living? No, no, they're all gone. And uh, I call myself an orphan. <laughs> Did you go to an integrated school or a segregated school? Oh, in the South End, um, they were integrated, but I only had two blacks in my, fam in, in my elementary school. And in high school, only four in my, so you can see that there was probably one black person living on each of the streets in the South End because uh, at that time, and later on I understood that it, even in the 40s, a represent, a, mayor, a white um, runner for, a rep, for the House of Representatives had said, if you elect me, I will see that no ch black children go to the South End uh, schools and that no blacks will be in, will be bused. To the, so you can see what kind of a situation. I knew nothing about that because I was, you know, this last child. Now, did you have any kind of racial uh, problems when you were growing up in, in school? Did anybody call you names or fight? <laughs> well, nigger was called. and. Um, my answer was, I guess I was a pacifist. I said, you know, sticks and stones will break my bones. The names will never hurt me, but I had two older sisters, and they would find this person who called me nigger, and, and she would say, you call my sister a nigger? Bang! <laughs> Now, I understand you were an excellent student uh, when you were graduating from high school. You want to tell us about that? Well, both in elementary school. You see, when I got, what happened is so many of our sisters went to these schools that when I came along, they said, oh, here's another Taylor girl. And that meant in, in their minds that I would be a good student. But I, I, I didn't have that idea. I just did what the teacher said, and I was a good student. From elementary school, I, another girl and I had the highest uh, academic record, and the same girl and I vied in graduation at high school uh, for valedictorian. She wrote, her paper was accepted, and uh, so I was not the valedictorian. And it didn't seem to bother me at that time, but later on when I looked at the, um, our 
that graduation book, I wondered. I said she was white, and was that part of the? I couldn't tell. But uh, an, another event happened the same time. There was a very um, wealthy black family that that uh, at that particular year said, "Whoever is the highest academically in the whole city, black, gets a four-year scholarship." So that was Francis. <laughs> And what did you do with the scholarship? Where did you go to school? Oh, um, I had a sister living in Chicago, so I went to the University of Chicago. And uh, believe me, when I, I was a very country girl, because they put me on this train by myself, and I made it. But when I walked into the administration building and looked at these oriental rugs, falling off the railings from from my spice, sparsely lit house, I felt that life was going to be a big change for me. Uh, How was it being in a big city for the first time? Um, it was exciting, really. Uh, they had they had given me, they had a friend who was going to introduce me to the big city. That helped a lot. And also, all during the, that year, those four years, that was the year of the new Negro. Alain Locke had just written his book. The Renaissance was taking place on the week. And so we, we had that. And so it was, it was fantastic, you know, the, the, the uh, you know, more enlightened things that happened because of all this happening, you know. So I was, it, it, where, where, the time and place that you are is very important, you know. Tell, tell me how you met uh, Catherine and Albert Dunham. Oh, Albert was a student. Oh, was he a student? He was a, a fair-haired boy. <laughs> I'm saying this about a black person. <laughs> At, um, a student, a protege of T.V. Smith, who was at the philosophy department. And uh, he was a student there. Um, he ended up a Phi Beta Kappa and, a, and had his PhD. And uh, he brought his sister, Catherine, from Joliet to Chicago, the university. And she roomed with me at my sister's for a while, so we were quite close. Did you dance with her? Uh, dance with well, her? we were taking dancing lessons. She was, she was much much better than I, but so I went along. I, we, we took ballet, we took tapping. We also, we had a big, um, a, uh, oh, we were in a cube theater, which was part of the overflow of this whole business of uh, the Black Renaissance. So we did some acting. And uh, I eventually married Albert Dunham in my third year. And, uh, he was going to Harvard, Harvard, and so I went, did my fourth year at Boston U and got my bachelor's from Boston University. What is your first bachelor's degree in? Well, that's a good question. Um, it was in philosophy because I did not do the scientific things, and uh, Boston U doesn't give you a BA unless you do a, uh, have taken a lot of science, so I got a bachelor's of philosophy. and. Uh, which was fine with me, and uh, Albert eventually was recruited by Elaine Locke to teach at Howard University, so that was my next step on that. But he was, um, he had gone to Harvard to be with these great uh, philosopher Whitehead and the mathematicians up here. So this began my living in a very high rate of rarefied air from that point on. So life is exciting. Again, as I, I've always said, somehow I open my palms and gifts fall in them. So, But fortune also does, fate does some other things to you. So who else <laughs> did you meet at Howard University? Oh, that was a great period. It was like a mecca. Um, Ralph Bunch was there. Uh, Sue and Howard Thurman, um, Sterling Brown, E. Franklin Frazier, I took courses under him, you know, and 
and I, I could name a lot of people that, because it was a great mecca at that time, in, in, in bringing in the a very, very, you know, high academic people. It was another great experience, even though that's when fate sort of uh, told me that I wasn't always going to be flying high. So you had your son Kay in Washington, D.C.? Yes, I did. But I also had two tragedies in my life. I became a widow with two children because I had eventually, after a while, met the Catlett family, and so I had married John Catlett. But it ended that I was a widow, and so it was hard times came along at this time uh, as the mother of two children. But I, I think, you see, the early life had told me that if you have managed other things, you're going to manage this. So I think that's how I have operated. If you look back and you took and you handled this, you're going to handle the next thing. Great trust. So what caused you to uh, migrate to San Francisco in 1946? Well, that was the end of the period that was difficult. And uh, my friends, the Thurmans, were coming to take over the church for the fellowship of old people. And with a little pushing, they said, I think you've had enough of Washington, D.C. So that's how I came in 46, you see. So you packed up uh, your son. But I, I've, I've left out something that's very important because my second year in college, I had lost my father. And uh, that was a great, it was a sudden thing. He died of a heart attack. So that was a very great loss in my life. And how long did your mother live? Oh, my mother was 88 years of age before she died. Before she died. And she had been a remarkable, they had been remarkable parents. They brought everything they knew from their experiences on the plantations. They, she canned everything from our garden. Uh, she sold everything. I never had a dress of my own until I graduated from Element <laughs> because my mother would sew from the, the old clothes and we'd, uh, it would be new to us when we came along. She, she was remarkable. She did every, everything. She supervised the house, and she's, she, she knew everything. <laughs> now, how did you travel to San Francisco? By train? Oh, by train, yeah. Yeah, we came at the time. There was a big fair, I think, in uh, Chicago, and I think we stopped for a minute. And then, fortunately, I was able to stay with the Thurmans until I, for about a year with my family. And that's the year I went to Mills College. Also, they... Howard Thurman's books had been um, published by their Mills College beautiful uh, publishing company. So somehow I got a scholarship. And, and I supposedly I was the first black student that they had had. Uh, that's allegedly. Uh, they haven't, they're still working on that. They think it's so. <laughs> so did you, uh, you ventured into painting when you moved to Oakland? and you started taking classes at San Francisco. Yeah, uh, that's not the first, that's not how I started. When I moved to Oakland, I, I had already been part of the Public Welfare Department in Washington. So I entered um, San Francisco Public Welfare Department, and it was my career there from, say, 48 to, like, 65. I went through all the departments and supervised, and. Again, uh, I was a, they had taken, they had some clerks who were black, but they had not had any black social workers. But, um, so I was supposedly the first black. However, the, uh, there was one man there that I knew was passing, and he never took off his hat, so I was not the very first social worker. <laughs> oh, we, we have some in-jokes, you know. <laughs> Um, so you met an, um, an artist who was te uh, te teaching classes at the Legion of Honor? Oh, yes. Um, we, we had a, that time, social workers really had a different kind of uh, reputation. So we had some, I had a group of very wonderful workers. And not only did we work together as social workers, but we would take trips and do things. And 
uh, we found out that you don't say no to anything. So one of them said, there's a fine artist out, out uh, at the Legion of Honor, let's go. So that's where I began to, I had already had the year of, of arts and crafts at Mills, but I did it thinking as a social worker, I would be working in, with it with, in group work, never thinking of myself as, and I, because I already had two designated artists in my family, so far as I know, you know, that, that. so it worked out very well because um, when I finally retired, uh, I just kept on getting, going to the Institute of Fine Arts and the um, extension, UC extension art group, so I and ended up with a marvelous colorist. And uh, so I had a very good background for painting. Tell us how you came to work at Hidden Villa in Los Altos. Oh, um, Mills College, and I had a, a very fine friend at Mills College. She was the niece of the head counselor. And uh, the head counselor had tried to get me to stay there on the staff as a counselor. And I said I couldn't do that because I had the two children. But she put me on the staff at Olney Hall as um, a counselor. And I, I'll bring this in, I'll get back to the Hidden Villa in a minute. But that was interesting because I just thought, you know, as I, I wasn't thinking of myself as, uh, as black or, or what. I was, I was going to be a counselor. But I found out from her notes later that she thought that I was going to be useful in, in, help, in getting rid of prejudice. So we'd have some, the, the parents, she wrote a note and said, oh, the parents don't mind, didn't mind at all, and the girls liked it. You never know what the other agenda is. But, uh, so uh, her niece and I were very good friends, and her niece knew about Hidden Villa, and she got me to go on the staff there. This was, uh, Hidden Villa was set up by um, two Quakers, Josephine and Frank Duvernick, and I found out that they were only allowing one half of their children to be white, and then they, they were reaching out to bring in other ethnic groups. And uh, what they did also was to go to all the white camps and, they, and, and get them to open up their. So they were very, they're great humanitarians. And, uh, that's been my second home. Hidden Villa has been our second home almost ever since. All my grandnephews and sons and have gone, and, and granddaughters have gone there. And it's, a, it's still operating as a remarkable camp. Now, anyway. when did you decide to go to University of California at Berkeley for a master's degree? Um, of course, that was later than it should have been. And, um, that was later than it should have been because uh, what I learned from getting my master's, I wished I had had it much earlier. I, it, uh, it was a great experience. Uh, it, it's done by uh, the, the, the uh, San Francisco uh, Social Welfare Department. Gives, they, allow, they give you a stipend, a stipend if you want to go and get your master's. So that's what I did. And uh, it was... I read so much that I didn't read after that for a year, but, <laughs> and in a way it was an advantage to go late because you were getting all of the late uh, information rather than the early information. Now about this time you participated in your first art show. How did you come to participate in an art show? Um, oh, that was another interesting, easy way to get into, to, to start getting into the galleries. Fellowship Church uh, it was, uh, we called it the golden era. They would have all kinds of wonderful um, projects, play projects going and art. And so there was a tea. Uh, they called it the green tea. And I, they said at this lady's house, and please bring some of your paintings. And Laura Williams and I did that. And um, Velma, Berkeley happened to be there and saw my painting. Uh, she and her husband run the post in, in uh, Oakland, uh, and they had this wonderful building and a great gallery. She was making sure that 
that even though her husband was interested in money, that she was going to have a gallery. <laughs> and she saw my painting, and she set up an amazing uh, reception for it. And uh, it was my beginning of having being shows and getting publicity on that. So between uh, th those was the wonderful days, Hidden Villa, which is in Los Altos, um, California, and th uh, the, the, the Juvenix had bought 2,500 acres of uh, down there for this, and it's still there. You know? yeah. So after you got your master's, you went to work for Sacramento State College? Yes. Um, uh, again, I went to one of the uh, graduates' um, parties, and the and uh, 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 the head of another department was there. And I said, "It would be nice to teach." And he said, "He said, where's your napkin?" So he wrote two names on the napkin and said, "Go and see these people." <laughs> so I went and saw these people and became. A part of the staff of Sacramento State College, you know. And then, so is that yeah. when you worked with um, the National Association of Social Workers? Oh yes, and during that time, I became a chairman, um, uh, a, a chairman of one of the committees, the Action Committee, and that was the time of the uh, uh, oh, so many protests were going on, the farm workers, and. Uh, so we we did our bit. Uh, we, uh, 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 I, you know, this was part of my job to set up a program while I'm a chairman. So we were out there parading and protesting. And the other thing that came up, uh, I was caught by the the idea of an urban coalition which was being set up in other cities. It was the idea to get the administration of the city to bring together those who have with those who have not, to so to actually be talking to them and working out what is it you don't have. So I introduced that to the um, uh, to Sacramento and didn't see the end of it, however, because I was recruited for this other other wonderful job in San Francisco. Do you want to tell us a bit about that? Well, um, the San Francisco a mental health society had been given a fund of like $25,000 for three years and wanted to know what to do with it. Joe, Joseph Williams is an attorney, was on the board, and he, uh, I was, had been very close to the family because Laura Williams was one of the finest artists ever. <laughs> and so Joe said, Francis, I think this is just your job. So I did leave to go down to to San Francisco. They wanted, they thought, well, with $25,000 a year, part of it will be your salary. Maybe we can use it for uh, for publicity for the visiting nurses. But that's, uh, that's not what I wanted to do. They accepted my program. I had been teaching child welfare, and I had been saying to these children, who is this child we're talking about? And also, I had been impressed by Eric Erickson's picture of what must happen f for the first nine months of an infant. So with the idea that there are a lot of parents on the poverty level uh, living in some of the um, projects, if, if one could get in there and uh, give them some help with their infants. So that's what, that's what the project became. It became the Parent Infant Neighborhood Center called PINC, Pink, mostly Pink. It took two years to get it ready. Uh, been traveling. The um, government had asked the uh, one of the uh, top uh, sc uh, school universities on the East Coast to outline what would be the standard for having infants um, in a group. Before infants were usually taken care of and by. Um, nurses in a hospital and kept in the cribs, you know, ending up with inf infantile schizophrenia. So this, so when they set up the standards for any group for children from, and remember, uh, you had, your child had to be 18 months before they would, you could go to a 
center. So now we wanted to work with the infants up until 18 months. So using that wonderful standard and, and working with, uh, I had to work hard with uh, the black, uh, black community in San Francisco because the mental health was a pretty white uh, uh, agency living, you know, uh, downtown. And uh, so we, we had a big, co we had to work with them beautifully with a committee, getting them on committees and accepting the fact that, that uh, the, the, the Mental Health Society was not going to accept the fact that the blacks were going to run it <laughs> with all that money because we ended up with $100,000 per year for three years. And uh, they called me a broken record because I would keep telling them, oh, yes, they are. <laughs> yeah. So it was an exciting experience. And I only stayed with it as a director until I found this perfectly, the perfect person. She was just graduating from UC and getting her PhD in, in this, and she came on after I had take, been with it for four months. And she stayed for four years. Glendora Patterson, she did a beautiful job. So that was a very high point. And it also was my swan song in my social work career. You see. So you retired in 1972? Yes. And kind of focused on travel and painting? Yes. I decided not to be a volunteer in social work because I know better. If you work with somebody, you have, and it's your little finger goes in, your whole body has to go. You can't just say, you know, nothing. So uh, I did have a, a period, and my first trip I did took on my own. I said, I'm going to go, uh, I say on my own, but I had a very good friend here who had a niece in France and a nephew in Spain. And I knew, uh, and um, I knew um, Louis Achille because he had taught it. He had been one of the big people teaching from France at Howard University. So we had kept up relationships there. So he was there. So I did this remarkable trip, and I have I have a book full of pictures because I uh, he they happened to be doing a pilgrimage. In, in uh, Normandy, um, this was a Catholic group, and they do pilgrimages, and it goes from one um, goes from one place to another, you know. And so it was, and also I was going to hit all of the art, uh, fine art museums, which I did. So it was a great experience. You know? How did you come to go visit China? Oh. Because I was still traveling, and the tour came up, and uh, I was married at that time to, to uh, Matt Crawford, and everybody sort of knew Matt Crawford. Mr. He was Mr. Berkeley, a very, very um, devout activist, and he had, you know, he's, he, and um, it was funny because his nephew said to me after he got married, you don't know how much of an activist he is, do you? I said, no, not really. <laughs> I found out. <laughs> but he was a remarkable person, so we took that trip to China. And this is a painting that I did after uh, China because the jade, you know, the feeling of China and jade uh, was still in my mind, you know. So what inspires you to paint, Francis? Uh, I couldn't tell you that. Uh, remember, I, we took this, um, we went to the Legion of Honor. Well, what happened there is every time I did something, um, the instructor would bring it back the next day, framed, and say, look what you did. So, so I mean, that kind of grew. And, uh, um, I, I found out I was a painter, <laughs> and I, it's, it's, uh, I'm not painting as much now of co uh, at this age, because uh, other things have, have to be done. And I don't know whether that wonderful creative spirit's gone or not. I'll find out when I'm not doing some of the, uh, so many of these other things, if I can get, it takes a lot of energy 
to create. If your energy is going someplace else, you don't create. Now, you've had showings in over 50 galleries. Talk oh. about that. How has that come about? Uh, how did that come about? Well, as I told you about the first big gallery, and, the, and I, I have had a lot of um, publicity, and um, how did it come about? Well, what you do, you find out, sometimes you get called, sometimes you find out there's going to be a show, and you, and you apply, you bring your things in. And uh, I, I, it's a combination of those two things, you see. You're asked to show, or else you, uh, make, you, you, you pass the uh, test of going and getting your, sh your things into those shows. So um, I've been at the Bomani, which has got a really very fine reputation. And um, uh, uh, for one, uh, another thing came up there. I was in the Oakland Museum with a group at one time. And then the very big 26 black fine artists were shown in um, the Triton uh, down in Santa Clara. And that was a fantastic show on that. But that's just the so that's the way you do it, you see. And you get help from, as I say, from publicity. You get help from selling your paintings, you, too. I have about 60 collectors in the United States and Canada, so which is not, not bad, you know. So uh, it, it was, uh, I, I don't have a, I had a studio at one time. I had two studios at one time, but the, the, I didn't. I wasn't able to keep them going all the time. You know? Do you remember what it felt like to sell your first painting? <laughs> that was very interesting. If, if you if you remember that I said a friend, one of my social workers said, "Let's go to the Legion of Honor." So, so I we we did a lot of. Um, outdoor painting, we would go to the places, and I was doing sail sh sailboats. And um, somebody saw one of my sailboats and said, Could, would you sell that to me? And I, I looked at her, and I said, did you just say sell? She, I got $10. So I told my friend who was going with me, and she said, somebody bought your painting? <laughs> that was a wonderful beginning. <laughs> <laughs> how do you uh, sketch an image? Do you sketch an image first in pencil, or how do you start painting? Oh, no. I, for me, I do not believe in, in uh, drawing anything or planning anything the night before, because I always feel that that limits you to what, you, what your mind did the night before. So I, there's the canvas, the bare canvas. You get it ready. And somehow you put a, a color on it, and then things happen. I, I can't tell you. Uh, it's, it's very interesting how this happens. Sometimes, uh, once in a while, you, ha you do come with something you want to do. I had, um, or, or sometimes you're doing something that is blends in with something you didn't know it was going to happen. I was painting uh, one time a black figure with, with the woman on his shoulder. Uh, he, was a young, he was a young man, and she was a young woman. And I learned that day that, that uh, Mildred Howard's son had been killed, and I found out that, that he had been the big supporter of his sister. And this, these two turned out to be almost look like them. So uh, I, I have had interesting experience. For instance, during the period I told you that I was grief stricken um, about the death of Albert, and, and um, it took me five years almost to go. But during that time, when I was extremely depressed, words would form, and the poet, the poet, the the poem would come out, and I didn't do it. So I don't understand this kind of. Uh, 
I don't understand it, so I can't try to tell you. Uh, I think maybe we all have experienced something like that. If we let it go, I guess. I, I, I can't explain that, you know. I wish somebody would explain it to me. So how do you know when a painting is finished? <laughs> I don't know that either. You just stop and say, that's it. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and how do you name your paintings? Well, that's interesting because I do name them after I do them, and then if it's been like four or five years, I'll, I'll say, oh, I think I'm going to name it this. <laughs> and sometimes the name changes. Fortunately, if I have written the name on the back of the painting, it stays there. But uh, uh, I don't think you should change the name of your painting, but it sometimes happens. And then, and then. I'm trying to think what I call this. I call it, uh, I don't know. I can't remember. I have to look at the back of it. <laughs> now, one thing we didn't cover is how many uh, boys and girls did your parents have? Oh, my poor father had only one son and nine girls. Uh, maybe he kept trying to get another son. I don't know. <laughs> But the other thing about my father, you know, during during the um, during that time, getting a job, um, getting a job would uh, not be the easiest thing for black people. But I found out that the post office uh, hired a lot of them. My father had the same kind of job in three different places. He was a he, he packed china wear in one, and then he worked for a printer in another. That's what he did. But I noticed that most of the people in Hartford uh, were, would go to the post office. And it was a prejudiced town until a minister, um, a very great minister of, of our church, um, was badly beaten on, when he went on a train trip. He ha just happened to walk through the white thing, and he was beaten. And so when he came back to Hartford, uh, that began the beginning of, what do you do about this? And so uh, one of my sisters and the committee began uh, the Urban League and uh, so, so to, to fight this civil thing. So that's what happened in Hartford. It was a, more than I knew. Uh, I, I, I didn't, we didn't talk politics. So we talk church. <laughs> now, your father was a pastor without a pulpit. Um, yes. Were you concerned about his welfare when he traveled? Oh no, he he wasn't traveling. Oh, he was just he was a pillow of the of the uh, Union Baptist Church in Hartford. That's where he uh, he went there because he knew that some of his fr uh, slave friends from off the plantation were already there. They call it the Hard Shell Baptist Church. They all already had a church going there. And he stayed with the church even when it split because, you know, there are splits in churches. <laughs> and, um, and he was on the committee that uh, bought this church that still exists and it's a heritage thing. It's, it's a beautiful church on Main Street in Hartford. So he was, he wor he was a deacon. And you waited for his prayer. His prayer, he could pray. It went up <laughs> right then. I, so uh, we youngsters, it's interesting, I was thinking, we lived in church, we youngsters, and I think the family made sure we behaved well, but I don't think they always knew what we were thinking because uh, we weren't always thinking what they were thinking about the religion. You see, we would sit up in the gallery, and, and if you're young enough, you would watch people get happy, and then you would say, there she goes, you know what I mean? <laughs> you would not recognize that this was the spirit of God, <laughs> their spirit of God. <laughs> so. Was uh, there anything else you wanted to add? Do you want to talk about your 90th birthday party? Or how many grandchildren you have, great-grandchildren? Oh. I have uh, five grandchildren. I have two sons, five grandchildren. Who are your sons? Michael Catlett and Kay Lawrence Dunham. 
Um, I have six great-grandchildren and innumerable great-grand-nephews and nieces. It's a very big family. Um, it's a very, uh, there's one thing about th this, um, uh, I, I, I always have given everything that happened to me to my parents. It's like a, it's some kind of gift and he has, and the family has had this gift somehow. And we think that the achievements of, of my father's family, you know, from shore to shore, there are all they, they're artists, they're art historians, they're educators, they're, uh, you name it. They have helped. They have enriched the culture of the of this country. This and, and they're still doing it. So I think it all. I, I always give it to my father and mother. Somehow the genes that came down, because, because uh, it does happen that way. It, it, uh, the uh, our our race is a very wonderful race. I think you know. So though so I had this big party on, the, on my 90th birthday, which I. I have a friend who disagreed with how it was done because all of our other picnics, we, all of our other parties, we went on little picnics and didn't, didn't spend much, you know, didn't spend a lot of money. But I have a grandniece who is, has her masters and organizations and stuff, and so she organized a huge party, and I was very shocked about it because people had to pay to come to this because it was in a hotel. They had to pay for their dinner, and over a hundred people came. But, but my friend called my niece and said, "That's not a Francis party. She, she's a picnic girl. Why are you doing this?" <laughs> so my niece's answer to her, "Well, why don't you, you can do it that way, and I'm doing it this way." <laughs> but anyhow, it was a great, part, a great affair. Yeah, I guess ninety. But I have a nephew. I have a grandson. Uh, Michael's grandson who says, I'll get excited when you get to be a hundred. I said, please, don't say that. <laughs> so, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, what Would you like to tell us about your family photos? Oh yes, I would. My mother and father John Osborne and Mary Agnes Taylor. I'm sitting on my, I'm, I'm sitting on a lap here. I'm the baby. My first, I told you, I, I, I told you that I had my first dress that was my own graduation from high school with my big bows. <laughs> uh, uh, this picture is all that I have from, from Howard University. We, this is the faculty women's part of the staff and we did things. I was a dancer at that time. I, one of the dances that we did in our, in not this group, but outside group, was um, black, a strange fruit hanging from a cottonwood tree. Travel time. In Spain. Part of the work as under the National Association of Social Workers, one of the big parades. This one was about housing, equal housing. Yeah, oh, one of my gallery shows. This was at Laney College, and and these two people are the curators from the Bomani Gallery who came to the show. Those are my two of my paintings. 
Uh, I think this should be out of the... I don't know if it can be seen in this way. The big party. This is a 90th birthday party. I just told you about it. Interesting enough, all of my, the, there's only one son here. The rest are grandchildren or grandnephews. That's how the family has grown all these years. That Kay Dunham is this one. Michael was doing something else. And I have some friends who think they are part of my family because we've grown up together. They, especially the little grandchildren that came in from my other family. One of my early paintings, this is interesting because way back when there was a model, Flo Allen, and she was a model for this. She was a, an, a, a great model. Everybody knew her, and she just died recently. On that. Well, thank you very much. The Coalition is proud to honor you as one of the historians in the program Eternal Voices for June 2002. Thank you. Oh, you're entirely welcome. Thank you.